One Soul at a Time, The Story of Billy Graham, The Library of Religious Biography, written by Grant Wacker, narrated by Trevor Thompson. Preface When I entered my small Methodist church one Sunday morning last winter, Bob Madry, a retired truck driver and old chum, walked over. I lost a dear friend this week, he said. Billy Graham brought me to Jesus. He saved my life. Bob paused, then added, I never shook his hand. A couple of weeks later, I asked Bob if he remembered where and when his conversion had taken place. He answered immediately and precisely, Raleigh, Wednesday night, September 26, 1973. At that moment, I knew that Bob spoke for countless others, salt-of-the-earth folk, everywhere. They never personally met Graham, but his ministry had remade their lives. Graham had died quietly in his sleep in his home in Montreat, North Carolina, on Wednesday, February 21, 2018, four days before I talked with Bob. The preacher was 99. On Saturday, the hearse bearing his body motored the 130 miles from Montreat to Charlotte. Along the way, the highway patrol blocked the on-ramps with wooden barricades and yellow tape. Fire trucks parked on overpasses, and cars in the oncoming lane pulled over. Officers saluted, grievers dabbed their eyes, and simple well-wishers quietly waved handkerchiefs. The following week, Graham's body would rest in three places. First up was Graham's childhood home, rebuilt on the grounds of the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte. On Monday, former President and First Lady George W. and Laura Bush visited. On Tuesday, former President Bill Clinton paid his respects. On Wednesday, the body was moved to the rotunda of the United States Capitol, where it would lie in honor for two days. Graham was the fourth civilian and first religious leader in American history to be honored this way. On Thursday, the body was moved back to the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte for the funeral and interment the next day. The service was an evangelical version of a state funeral. It unfolded under a 28,000-square-foot tent, reminiscent of the one that had sheltered Graham's breakout revival in Los Angeles in 1949. The event attracted President and First Lady Donald and Melania Trump, Vice President and Second Lady Mike and Karen Pence, North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper, former North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory, both North Carolina Senators Richard Burr and Tom Tillis, the Gaithers, Christian singer Michael W. Smith, 500 members of the media, representatives from 50 countries, and 1,800 ticketed friends from the political, business, government, entertainment, and religious worlds. Former President Barack Obama did not attend, but said that Graham gave hope and guidance to generations of Americans. Former Presidents George H.W. Bush and Jimmy Carter sent regrets, unable to come because of age. By 2018, attention of this magnitude was an old story. At the dedication of the Billy Graham Library 11 years earlier, former President George H.W. Bush had called Graham America's pastor. The label stuck. When Graham died, it showed up everywhere. For sure, some journalists had their doubts. In light of the nation's pluralism, one said America's pastor was meaningless. A small but vocal minority felt that Graham not only did not deserve the honor, but also had inflicted grave harm upon the nation. But clearly, the great majority accepted the label, either as a statement of simple sociological fact, or as an expression of their own feelings, or both. Graham's death revealed the breadth of the shadow he cast across the religious landscape. His message, said Safir Atiyal, an Indian Syriac Christian theologian, was his life as well as his words. The Roman Catholic Archbishop of New York, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, spoke for many journalists, possibly a majority of Americans, and countless Christians around the world. As anyone growing up in the 1950s and 1960s can tell you, it was hard not to notice and be impressed by the Reverend Billy Graham, the Cardinal intoned. Graham, always preached the same message, 
Jesus is your Savior and wants you to be happy with Him forever. Writing for the Religion News Service, journalist Yonat Shimron framed Graham's achievement in more historical terms. The preacher worked, she said, with a combination of zeal, integrity, and graciousness that won him admirers the world over. For millions, he seemed somehow to stand above the partisan controversies of the era, an ordinary man filling an extraordinary role. Billy Graham lived an enormous life. It would be hard to find a religious leader, or leader of any sort for that matter, who traveled more widely, or met more people, or addressed more pressing issues of the day than he did. It would take multiple fat volumes to tell his whole story. So in the interest of coherence, not to mention economy, I hope to simplify the task by focusing on one thread. I try to tell the story the way I think he would do it. More or less, anyway. The more part is that from time to time I add details he might not think to include, or events he was too modest to dwell on, or episodes that he clearly preferred to forget. The less part is that I mainly stick to Graham's public life, the things he did and said in public for everyone to see and hear. Two wrinkles slightly qualify that promise. Graham's wife, Ruth Bell Graham, weaves in and out of the narrative because she was very much part of his public presentation, and their son, Franklin, emerges in the later chapters for the same reason. Otherwise, I omit many interesting details about Graham's daily life that he might want to slip in, such as his chronic insomnia, or attraction to sunny beaches, or fondness for lemon cake and Big Macs. But interesting is not the same as important. What is important about Graham, what people will want to know about a century from now, is his public life. As much as possible, one soul at a time follows the main events in Graham's life chronologically, in the order in which they actually took place. Of course, Graham, like most people, didn't actually live his life that way in simple chronological order. Experiences overlapped, but the biographer cannot unfold multiple narratives at the same time. So in each of the chapters, or scenes as I prefer to call them, I try to highlight the main thread, the one that I think Graham himself probably would isolate as the key feature. When necessary, I sketch in the background or peek ahead to the outcome, but only when I need to in order to make sense of the moment. It is important to stress that one soul at a time is not an abbreviated version of America's pastor, Billy Graham and the Shaping of a Nation, a detailed thematic study of Graham that I published in 2014. In America's Pastor, I focused on Graham's relation to American culture. Here I focus on the man himself. The two volumes recount some of the same basic facts, of course, and some of the same basic ideas, too. In this volume, however, I frame similar facts and ideas in different ways for different purposes. Today, biographers of Graham have to figure out how to find him behind the huge cumulus cloud that his son Franklin Graham has created. The sun looms in the daily news as an extraordinarily influential evangelist, humanitarian, and culture warrior in his own right. Sometimes Billy and Franklin really did resemble each other but at other times they differed dramatically. Discerning the optics of that complex relationship would be a worthy project in itself, but it falls outside the scope of this book. One of the purposes of this study is to help listeners see Billy himself, as he really was, in his own times, and leave Franklin for another day. A few words about my point of view might be useful. Though I try to tell Graham's story as objectively as I can, I am the first to admit that the lens I use inevitably colors how I see him, so I suppose I should say a bit about that lens. I place myself in the broadly evangelical tradition of American religion that Graham did so much to create and shape. Usually, I find myself rumbling around somewhere on the left side of that tradition, both theologically and politically. But it is big enough and diverse enough that I feel comfortable thinking that we are all part of the same family. Viewing Graham from this perspective, then, 
I see him as one of the most influential Christians, and certainly the most influential evangelical Protestant Christian of the 20th century. He was a great man who helped bring spiritual meaning to the lives of millions around the globe. At the same time, Graham, like all great men and women, also had serious character flaws and made serious mistakes. I certainly believe that the strengths far outweighed the weaknesses, yet that complexity means that his story has much to teach us about the complexities of faith in the modern world. All that being said, I seek to avoid evaluating Graham for good or for ill. When he lived up to his own highest ideals, that should be evident. And when he failed to do so, that should be evident too. I try to let the listener judge. The book's title, One Soul at a Time, deserves a word. It comes from Ken Garfield, a journalist who covered Graham's crusades for the Charlotte Observer for many years. In 2013, Garfield said that the evangelist made people feel that he cared for them one soul at a time. Garfield was Jewish and never considered converting to evangelical Christianity, but he appreciated the gentle, inclusive spirit of the man who invited others to find a new faith or to renew an old faith grown cold. When Graham died five years later, Garfield wrote, we mark Graham's passing with gratitude and grief. He offered the promise and comfort of Jesus to the last person in the last row in the most distant venue on earth. But there is more. In one sense, Graham seems to be the last person on earth whose approach should be described with the words, one soul at a time. After all, he perfected the art of mass evangelism. He preached to 215 million people in 185 countries in crusades, rallies, and live satellite feeds. Of those, some 77 million saw him face to face in more than 70 countries. More than 3 million souls responded to his invitation to profess faith in Christ. He broke numerous attendance records, sometimes speaking to more than 100,000 people face to face in a single service. Indeed, Twice he spoke to more than one million in one event. If we add the folks who encountered Graham through his books, magazines, motion pictures, daily newspaper columns, and syndicated radio and television programs, the number swells beyond any easy reckoning. Hundreds of millions more, possibly billions, seem likely. With the possible exception of Pope John Paul II, said religion journalist David Van Bema in Time magazine, Graham touched more lives for Jesus than anyone else in the modern era, and extolled him directly to a greater swath of humanity than anyone else in history. Even so, Graham said that he always saw himself speaking not to audiences, let alone to nameless multitudes, but to individual hearts. That is where enduring change ultimately had to begin, with each person making their own decision to follow Christ, or not. This is not mass evangelism, he liked to say, but personal evangelism on a mass scale. Billy Graham very much wanted to invite every person on the planet to embrace the gospel, and he hoped to inspire them to try to reform society as a whole, from top to bottom. But his method, the way he sought to do it, was always the same. One soul at a time.